Good. So after discussi discussing various current and relevant topics in the micro perspective, we will conclude the virtual day by going into the third area or the third block, the use cases. We will start with Greg Tuzar and Greg Tech Paul together with David Wexman, who will talk about what the features of a prime broker should be and how to design one based on past experiences, also in regards to institutional investors. So David, Brett and Greg, welcome. And uh, I'm going to turn the floor to David. Thank you again, Nicolo. It is great to be here, uh, unfortunately virtually, uh, but with these, with a stellar uh, panel here to discuss what building a prime brokerage in crypto looks like when you're doing it right. Uh, but before we begin, Greg, Brett, why don't you tell us a little bit about your personal backgrounds? I think that the, the audience here would, uh, would love to know more about you personally. Sure, happy to, happy to start. Thanks so much for the invitation to be here and, and it's great to be a part of this program. Uh, I'm Greg Tusar, I'm head of institutional product here at Coinbase. Uh, I'm coming up on 30 years, uh, somewhere at the intersection of technology and, and finance. Um, the bulk of that for me was spent uh, at Goldman Sachs, uh, where I was the partner there responsible for their global electronic trading business. Um, and uh, left there to go to the world of high frequency trading and market making, but ultimately discovered uh, crypto in 2017 and um, found that it was at the very beginning stages of a journey that we've seen in many other asset classes in the trading of, of equity securities, fixed income securities and so forth. And uh, it's been a great privilege to be a part of the evolution of the crypto market structure, the bringing of some of the electronic trading tools that we developed to trade large blocks of, of equity securities into the crypto markets. Um, and and my, my observation would be that, you know, what took a decade or so to happen in, in equities um, has, has happened, as we'll talk about shortly, in a very short period of time. And so things are moving very fast. Um, I look after the product development in the institutional business, which includes our, our the building of our trading tools and our custody tools, uh, working very closely with my partner, Brett. Brett? Thanks, Greg. My name is Brett Tejpal. I've been with Coinbase only eight months, but it's been um, a very interesting and productive eight months for sure. Uh, I joined after 25 years of a career in sales and trading. I spent nearly 17 years at, at Barclays and my first nine years at JP Morgan. Um, I lived and worked in the, in the UK uh, from 2001 to 2013. At Barclays, I, I eventually became the global head of sales for, for both uh, fixed income and equities and different to most. Uh, my career, um, the thematic that ties together the 25 years is having been fortunate to be at the forefront of innovation all the while. So I started my life as an interest rate exotics trader and moved on into the credit derivative and equity derivative spaces. Uh, went on to manage the, the credit business, the commodities business, the FX business, the prime business, emerging markets, uh, along, along with others. Uh, my first introduction, uh, deep introduction into crypto came in in the early part of 2018, where we explored the possibility of opening an OTC trading desk in crypto. And having been sort of bitten by the bug, if you like, uh, I elected at the time actually not to do that, um, principally because I didn't think the infrastructure was there to operate safely in a, regu in a, in a heavily regulated environment. And I think what's interesting about that and the pivot into this discussion is that shortly after that moment, really only 18, 18 months later, uh, I took another deep, hard look at it. I, I was amazed at how quickly the infrastructure had formed around um, supporting crypto trading. And I thought that bec because of that, it would be a, a giant catalyst for institutional adoption. And so here at Coinbase, my responsibilities are, I look after the client facing functions for both high net worth and all institutional. So think of that as sales, uh, trading, um, custody and prime. Uh, and, and together with Greg, uh, we, we, we look after the institutional business from, from start to finish. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, when uh, people think about Coinbase, what probably registers in most people's heads is the retail experience. Coinbase has been around a long time. It was a trading, it was a first a, a way for people to buy Bitcoin at spot. It's evolved into much more than that. What is Coinbase today? It's mm -hmm. a great, great question. So um, 
the way I would break Coinbase down is into three separate uh, three separate divisions. One of which, as you said, is the um, consumer experience, the retail experience. We have over 35 million users that go there often to buy their first Bitcoin, but once they discover crypto and what they can do with the application to um, to invest, buy, stake. Um, you know, to, to really explore the cryptocurrency world. Um, and that's really our mission is to, to bring the open financial system to the, um, to the, to the consumer um, in that pillar. And in the second pillar is the institutional business, which Brett and I look after in, in there, um, the spectrum of clients we look after begins with um, the private client, the high net worth individual um, who's looking for a private client experience and needs all of the, uh, services that an institution also typically needs from there up to the largest pensions, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, um, and everyone in between. And basically in the institutional business, what we're providing is the combination of trading at scale. So the need not to buy retail sized, but um, measured in millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of of cryptocurrency and again, bringing some of the same techniques that we learned from uh, trading other liquid asset classes into crypto to be able to do that in an effective manner. So marrying the trading together with the custody. So the number one issue um, as was discussed in the, the prior panel is the safe storage of private key material. Um, Coinbase has the, the largest um, custody business organized as a trust company, sort of the way that the DTC is here in the US uh, for the safe storage of private key material, um, marrying trading together with custody, together with finance, which is sort of the run, bike, swim, if you will, for if if uh, institutional trading were a, were a triathlon. Um, and uh, we marry all three of those things into an end-to-end -end, uh uh, one-stop shop. And then the third pillar of Coinbase is the exchange itself. Um, and uh, we operate that um, in a central limit order book model, similar to the way that NASDAQ works in equities. Uh, we have the, the largest and most trusted regulated exchange um, where you can where you can buy and sell that our institutional business uses. But part of what our institutional business does is access not just that exchange, but aggregate all crypto liquidity. So our smart router and our algorithms are looking for the best price across the entire market. Excellent. Just, uh, one of the points I wanted to highlight here is there's a lagging perception of what Coinbase Institutional is. And we've, we've, we've evolved uh, quite rapidly, uh, even since the marriage of my, my, my arranged marriage with, with Greg uh, last summer. And so it, it's really important to be invited to important forums like this, where we can actually talk about the more fulsome products that we even have a financing business that we're growing as well. So just want to make those points. Well, we'll, we'll certainly explore that a little bit further. Uh, but Brett, actually, I did want to go uh, touch on a little bit about why you turned down a crypto OTC business not long ago. Um, can you tell us as clearly as possible what you saw missing at the time? It's it's actually um, pretty basic, and so when it comes down to, I was listening to Jean Michel's um, uh, presentation just before, and thinking through the reactions that I had at the time around private key management and all the things that could go wrong, and not having what I thought was a robust custodial offering, and so uh, I can deal with operational risk, uh, market risk, different types of risk, but I, I didn't think that the, the collective was there. It felt like there was uh, a lot of potential for human error. And so for those reasons, I didn't think at the time uh, that it was prudent to, to, to activate. If you look forward now and think about what, what Coinbase is today, uh, different to, to, to the uh, operating model that I evaluated and, and declined to activate just a couple of years ago, we abstract all that difficulty with private key management. And so we put tons of measures in place such that you can't fat finger it and send your crypto to a place that you didn't want to do that, right? And so we, we also, trading in crypto is massively capital inefficient. Uh, there, there are delays, unexpected delays, dealing with the tra traditional finance system, the receipt of wires, crediting accounts, et cetera. And so when I, when I evaluated uh, Coinbase's institutional platform and its potential to, to offer, a, a full service prime broker, I thought, wow, what, what an amazing opportunity. And, and it's, uh, it's already operating at scale and we're gonna have more exciting features as, as, as time progresses. 
And the, what does that actually mean? Now, so what is, what is operating at scale? Uh, Greg, maybe you can touch on this. What does the, an actual service look like to an institution? Maybe you can give us an example of, uh, without sure. names, of kind of what you actually offer today. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I'm going to drill down into a couple different use cases, but 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 zooming out before I do for one minute, you know, we described institutions. I just want to give a little bit more of a, a, a breakdown, a taxonomy of, of, of what that means. So I mentioned um, high net worth, private client. The world of institutions is really quite large. Um, so that that starts with family offices. It goes to traditional asset managers, um, hedge funds, folks that are generally organized as registered advisors um, that are regulated and want to face a regulated um, entity um, to transact and spot um, and derivative products. And um, so that could be a, a hedge fund uh, all the way up to a, a sovereign wealth fund. We also service... Um, other uh, banks, institutions, challenger banks, um, and increasingly others who would like to be in the business of custodying cryptocurrency, but have not uh, invested in the uh, custody business and the safe storage of private key material that we described. And so in many ways, we act as the technology layer behind those companies um, in providing them services. So each of the use cases is slightly different in each of those um, client buckets, but what I'll describe for you is a transaction that's really more for the, um, you know, for the institution or the private client, which begins with a, a white glove onboarding service, um, helping somebody get onboarded. Um, from a, a trading perspective, uh, we have an over-the-counter trading desk, and one thing that's different here, you know, when I stepped into crypto in 2017. The market structure looked like if you wanted to buy anything that wasn't retail sized, it was only a dealer market and it was largely conducted through chat. There was no, it was very hard to get competitive quotes uh, other than having lots of chat rooms open. There was really no technology that was brought to bear. Um, one thing we found exceptionally helpful just to begin with is that our over the counter desk is agency only, meaning it's not. Um, it's not providing principal prices to clients. Its only job is to be there to help uh, a client navigate the market structure. And we have one job, which is to get the best price, not to get the best price and to optimize our own P&L. Um, and so the trading process begins with the over-the-counter desk and the client saying, here's my objective. Here's the total amount I'd like to buy. Help me create a plan to get from point A to point B. Um, our desk can then use the technology themselves or the client can do it themselves as well. This is all available to them on their own desktop or increasingly some hybrid of those two where client can, um, you know, can participate with the over the counter. The desk is, is, is driving the transaction. We then go into the marketplace. Uh, we today aggregate seven exchanges in four different dealer prices, all of which we've vetted and done KYC. Uh, on to make sure that they pass our compliance standards so that a client importantly um, faces Coinbase and not um, doesn't have to worry about or diligence any of those other venues. We then go and use our tools and technology to, to engage the market. So one thing we've learned just given the given some of the transactions we've done is the nature of crypto liquidity and how to buy large quantities by being as stealthy as possible um, and so, not making a footprint. Let's talk a little bit about that, in fact. There's been certainly some high-profile bits of the news about companies who have bought, uh, at least in terms of crypto today, quite a lot um, at once. And they make an announcement saying that perhaps part of their corporate treasury has been bought uh, you know, using perhaps a, a firm like yours. Is, is that slow strategy you know, going to be necessary for the long term? Um, that is to say, if, as you look back, what was something maybe in 2017 when you started that you you couldn't do that you can do today? Yeah, I guess my brief answer, and that I'd love to get Brad's perspective on this too, is you know when I uh, uh, when we started electronic trading at Goldman Sachs, there was a, a room of 500 people that were manually making prices. When I left, um, you know, 14 years later, there were two of them left um, in the store, and you could probably could have done it with one if you tried really hard. And the story is one of applying technology um, 
and really advanced algorithms to the trading process. And the interesting thing in crypto is that whole process has taken place in, in a um, small number of years um, because everything in this day and age happens exponentially. And so I think in order to engage in some of the transactions that you just described, you need really good technology. You need the ability to trade across multiple marketplaces. You need the ability to disguise your footprint, to be uh, fleet of foot in terms of when you're in and out of the market and how to appear in the limit order books so that you're not sending signal to the rest of the marketplace that you're buying. Well, actually, I have a slightly separate question for Brett. Why do prime brokers need to exist in crypto? This isn't something that has been around for a long time. Does it need to be here? And what are the steps involved in creating something like that? It sure does. I, I just wanted to call out, though, we I wrote two actual, two case studies on two of the largest trades that have happened in crypto. Uh, you can access them on my LinkedIn profile. One of them focuses on MicroStrategy that shows us as, as their exclusive execution partner and, and One River as well. Um, so they're, they're a good read and it goes through the step-by-step -step process. Um, the answer to, to, as to as to why you need prime brokers, absolutely you need it. Uh, you need it because of the complexity of engaging in this marketplace. Um, there's ton, there are tons of things, ton, not just time delays, but key management and protocols. And there's a really long list of challenging things that, that we abstract away through the prime. And so you can think of prime as really um, a white glove service utility function that's let, that lets you act at scale at speed. And, and, and what we do is just make that process as easy as possible. We do it through short-term financing, longer-term financing. We do it through technological implementation. Uh, I'd invite you to, and the audience, to uh, consider reaching out and scheduling a demo so we can see some of these things to, to translate these concepts into practice. And I think the, uh, I totally agree with that. The, the, the ability to do this in one place, just given some of the challenges that, that again came up in the prior panel, uh, given the bearer instrument nature of crypto, the ability to trade, transact, um, store and cold and finance all in one place is increasingly important to people that are getting exposure to the asset class for the first time. For those that are crypto native, um, it, it's a bit easier to have unbundled services and do lots of different things in lots of different places. So we have both types of clients. We have to be really good at each of the individual services, but the bundle of things, especially for new entrants, is really important. Yeah, so one, one thing to call out, er, earlier in the year when I was immersing myself in this space and we had a bunch of large hedge funds that were high velocity traders, they had entered the marketplace through CME futures, but they had also opened accounts at, at, at let's say, uh, two or three different providers. And what they found was it was super clunky because they would buy one crypto at one place, try to store it with a custodian that actually didn't custody that asset. They would try to move funds um, across the blockchain. They found out they um, drained someone's hot wallet and, and therefore they couldn't actually get their crypto from point A to B to, to actually sell it. And so the, if you like, the, 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 we're not dreaming up the use case. The, the evolution of Prime is natural because we see all the pain points. And, and so what's happened is through the progression of, of last year, we've been rewarded by our largest clients by, by virtue of them actually consolidating all their activity with us because we solve all those pain points. And they also, as a consequence of, of dealing in just one place, that they've flattened out and reduced a lot of their operational risk and complexity. One last question for all of you before we take questions from the audience, which is what's missing? You know, what doesn't exist today in the prime brokerage space for crypto? that needs to be there or should be there? Well, I, I think what's missing is, is uh, sort of, you know, hour by hour, day by day, new institutional clients uh, are coming in and operating at scale. Uh, so so I, think, I, th I think that works. Um, pivoting away from just, just Coinbase itself, I, I do think we need the full expansion and, and the full institutional adoption um, across a number of different um, vectors in, in crypto. And, and the larger, larger that pool of players becomes, I think the more that we can collectively help each other solve pay points or, or put in customized solutions. And so, did you want to say something specific to Prime, Greg? Nope, you go ahead. So, okay. uh, I'm sorry, the one other thing I would add to that list, and, and this is emergent, and a lot has happened in the last 12, uh, 12 or 24 months, is the emergence of uh, banking partners uh, that will participate um, in the crypto ecosystem and the potential extension of credit 
um, into the ecosystem to facilitate um, financing activities and other things like that, sort of like the funding or the repo market does um, in the traditional securities world. And I do think, and I would predict that um, in the coming quarters, um, that that's going to change. And I think that will have a dramatic impact and really accelerate the growth of, of the, the whole digital asset space. Yeah, that, that plus the uh, the expansion of the insurance capacity in the marketplace. So we, we have the largest, uh, to my knowledge, the, the largest insurance policy, 255 million policy placed by Lloyd's um, in, into a syndicate of U.S. and U.K. insurers. And so uh, that's a really critical um, uh, component. We can also offer key clients their own policies. And so I do think that as the market begins to scale up, uh, the capacity to get larger and larger insurance policies will also be there. Well, I think this has been a fantastic discussion on some real use cases for institutional crypto today. Uh, and I'm grateful for all your answers. Nicolo, are there any additional questions perhaps from yourself or the audience? Yes, there are. So first of all, also to you, and thank you very much for this discussion. So I would just start with the questions. Um, since you mentioned it, what are the typical requirements of your institutional clients? And do you face any regulatory obstacles in Europe or under uh, some other uh, jurisdictions? So I would let it open. I'll give Greg and Brett uh, the possibility to answer that. So, sorry, the institution, the requirements to be defined as an institution, I'll interpret that as being um, anyone from high net worth and above um, in good standing. Uh, that would, that would, and that person or institution needs to be um, in good standing with respect to our KYC and AML. Uh, with respect to a, a targeted number, we would hope to invite clients that have that carry a balance of more than a, more than one million euro uh, or dollars um, even uh, on the platform. What was the second part of the question, please? Um, regulatory regulation again. So um... let me interpret that first. Do you work with Swiss clients as an example? Uh, do you work with clients pan Europe? We do. And so at a high level, we have a U.S. domestic offering for custody and execution. We have a duplicate offering uh, internationally. And so we, we have hubs of operation in, in lots of different places. Uh, we have a, a, a custodian based in Ireland. We, we opened an office in Berlin. We've got people on the ground <clears throat> for Tokyo and, and all across the U.S. From a, it, it's hard to you know, give a snappy response on, on, on regulation, but I, I do want to say this. From, from the very beginning, we've opted in to becoming regulated, and it's my expectation that over time, I think the regulatory environment will ultimately um, be pro-digital assets. Uh, as we've seen with the, with, with the most heavily regulated banks, I think they think that digital assets are part of their future, part of everyone's future. And so as a consequence, I do hope that uh, the regulation will accommodate um, more activity in the space. And Coinbase is firmly positioned uh, to deliver into that. So um, I, I would love to uh, continue to have constructive um, conversations with regulators that allow us to, to, to really amplify the activity uh, that's here today. I think you're not the only one, but uh, that's another discussion then. Good. So um, thank you very much, David, uh, for moderating this session here, this talk, this fireside chat. Uh, thank you, Greg and Brett. So you will also join.